tabernacle. <clears throat> Spiritually, we also know that there was a progression from that where Jesus died on the cross and in his death, he, as it were, and we gave explanation of this a couple of classes ago, he exchanged his body from being just, just that physical body to the church, the body of Christ. <clears throat> and the body of Christ now is the temple of God and that's the full progression. So really, we're adding in around this, but we're talking about the change from the tabernacle to the temple, from Jesus incarnate and him being with us, God with us, Emmanuel, to God in us, the temple of God, the temple of God, meaning we're the temple and God dwells within us and inhabits us. <clears throat> so we, we spent the last two classes really, really, really dealing with this taking of the ark thing because that is a type and shadow and a picture of the cross. The true picture, not the shadow, because you can't see perfectly looking at the shadow. The true picture was Israel didn't run out saying he's going to deliver us. Israel ran out with the ark and delivered it into the hands of the Gentiles so he could be put to death. Just as the ark was put into the hands of the Philistines, who were also Gentiles. And so we want to finish that off, but to do that, we need to look again at uh, 1 Samuel uh, and see the end result of this. So it's really the whole fifth chapter. Um, so we're just going to read it. It's only 12 verses. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 5, beginning with verse 1, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, apparently they had this place, this house, uh, this location where the Philistines had all these idols, false gods set up. And the Ark of the Covenant was set in there with them. <clears throat> now that's significant and spiritually significant because <clears throat> Jesus wasn't just delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. The Gentiles, as it were, put him to death and uh, was, um, how should we say this? <clears throat> For lack of a better way, was faced with defeating the enemy. And we'll see, we're, I'm going to back this up with New Testament scriptures here shortly. <clears throat> uh, not just Gentiles, not just unbelievers, but as it were, put down into their house, put down into death, put down into the realm of darkness. <clears throat> and, um, and so you see that in type and shadow here. And we might as well, you know, keep your place here because we want to read that. But it would be good if I just right now went ahead and read Colossians chapter 2 so that you can see this. Colossians 2, keeping your place in 1 Samuel 5, of course. And verse 14 and 15 <clears throat> Lighting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And then verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Okay, so here we see Jesus in, the, in his death and in the cross, spoiling principalities and powers and making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. <clears throat> so the ark representing this death uh, as it is handed over from the Gentiles to this uh, place where these false gods are, <clears throat> these principalities and powers. And they, were, they set it in there by Dagon, who was their main... Uh, Dude, <laughs> he was their main dude. 
their main idol dude. <clears throat> and when they of Ashdod arose early on the next day, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. <clears throat> I disagree with that. I think that the ark set him in his place. <laughs> but they, they think they put him back in his place. But the Lord put him in his place. <clears throat> and um, uh, <clears throat> that's it, where we're. And let's say before the ark of the Lord. And the, okay, I'm jumping here. <clears throat> Verse four. And when they arose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. <clears throat> wow. First of all, wouldn't that freak you out a little bit? <laughs> Uh, and so the first time he was just bowed down <clears throat> and uh, the second day they come back in and his head is cut off. Well, we, we understand that, don't we? I mean, really, it's like the serpent. Jesus cut off the head of the serpent, the way to get rid of a serpent. And the serpent has always represented Satan, principalities and powers. Is to uh, You know, we've had him at the ranch. And how many of you have here killed a poisonous snake at the ranch? Raise your hand. <clears throat> got quite a few, four or five. Um, and any of you kill it by nipping its tail off? <clears throat> or, you know, I mean, I've seen them, I have seen them, you know, cut in half and they'll still bite you. You, know, you cut their head off. <clears throat> and even with that, you got to wait a little while till it dies. You don't go playing with it. <clears throat> um, My wife isn't in here, and she killed one, and we got it. <clears throat> there she, oh, there she is, back in the back room there. <clears throat> um, and uh, <clears throat> so the second time around, the head is taken off in the hands, and he's laying down before the ark. <clears throat> in verse 5, Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. <clears throat> and the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with tumors, even Ashdod and its borders. Well, I don't know what your translation says, but the true translation of tumors there, uh, it's, it's, it says emeralds, but they didn't pronounce the H like they don't in Spanish, so it would be hemorrhoids. So that's, from everything I've searched out, that's what it was. I guess God was showing them that they're a pain in the, the rear. <clears throat> All right, and so moving right along here, verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon our God. <clears throat> All right. So there is a sense that they defeated Israel and they took the ark. That's the way the story reads here. But in reality, he's down in their realm and he is giving them fits. Not Israel. Israel isn't giving them fits. Israel lost. He won. He wins over the enemy. <clears throat> and don't forget that. Don't forget that. Don't think, uh, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of truth to this, but most people uh, really distort it. He doesn't give you power. He is the power, ultimately. The cross is the power, and that cross crucified the things that make you susceptible to the enemy, which is you. Because <laughs> you're susceptible. So that's why he doesn't give you power in the sense of what most people think. I mean, you know, that, well, someone will quote to me, well, my God, I disagree. What is it, Acts 118, is it, or 8, something like that. And he says, you know, that when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power. <clears throat> and if you study that out, it, it says that you shall be a martyr. 
you shall die. And that's the power that ends up being your power over the enemy, the cross. <clears throat> not the cross crucifying the enemy, folks. There's not a one scripture that says that the devil was crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Why? Because in your death, there's a resurrection and you're made one. The devil wasn't crucified and then resurrected and made one with Jesus. But you are. So even though there's a death, there's something greater than, than that. It brings you out of one realm into another realm. <clears throat> um, okay, so... Verse 8, uh, they sent therefore and gathered all the lords, the lords of the Philistine, O oh Lord, <clears throat> gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? In other words, this is a domain, this is a realm that doesn't like him in there. He's spoiling them. He's, he's defeating them. He's everything, nothing they can do. All their gods, all their strength, all the things that they think have worked in the face of the ark of God, they're not working. Well, folks, that's a shadow. Jesus, in his death, defeated principalities and power, powers and spoiled them openly triumphing over them in it. And here's an open triumph that's taking place right here. <clears throat> and uh, so, let's see, what shall we do? And they answered, let the ark of, of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of God of Israel about there. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction, and he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. Hmm. Some of you are kind of going, you know, I didn't really believe him at first, but I think these emeralds are in the secret parts. <clears throat> and, uh, now, they were originally in the city of Ashdod, and now they've come to Gath. So they brought the ark to another place of their domain, uh, domain and he's defeating all of them in all of their different realms. <clears throat> in verse 9, and it was so that after they had carried it about, oh, let's see, I did that one, didn't I? Okay, verse 10, therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron, and it came to pass as the ark of God, this is another city, not Ashdod, not Gath, Ekron, okay? And it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of God, the God of Israel, to us to slay us and our people. Because they've already heard that th everywhere the ark goes, they get defeated. And so they're going, you know, they're looking at this like not a present. You know, you do know that a lot of the conquerors of that age when they defeated somebody, when they defeated a king, they wouldn't normally kill him. They would parade him through the crowd. And so here they have the ark of God, and, and they're thinking, okay, we took it from Israel, and we're going to parade it before our people and show that our God is greater. And <clears throat> Jesus, in his death, not in his resurrection, in his death, defeated these things. <clears throat> and so they're, they're going, look, None of us have any power here. We are in fear. We are defeated. <clears throat> and uh, verse 11, So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the, the God of Israel and let it go again to its own place. Let it go again to its own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there, and the men that died not were smitten with the emeralds. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. <clears throat> Some pretty bad emeralds there. <clears throat> and um, so... We won't read the rest, but 
they devise a plan on how to do that. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> they make a cart and they, they get a couple of oxen and they put that thing on the cart and they sort of go, go that direction. <laughs> and the two oxen are lowing as they go and they keep going and they don't turn left or right, they take it right into Israel, <coughs> right on the edge. <coughs> anyway, um, so this, uh, interestingly enough, it got right to the edge of the land <coughs> and, um, uh, well, before I say that, let me just say, and maybe there's couple of things I need to read here before I get into that because right from the edge of the Philistines and the edge of darkness and the edge of the idols is the land and before it comes to David's tabernacle before it comes to Zion there's a process that's going to take place <clears throat> so let me just make sure in my notes here that I've got uh, what we what, what I wanted to cover in this first part there's one final aspect of the taking of the ark that pertains to Christ crucified that we have to examine. In the Old Testament, we read that the Philistines took the ark of God at the hands of Israel, but the Philistines had a problem with it, so they eventually sent it back on a bullock cart. While in death and separated from his body, because he was neither in the tabernacle nor in David's tabernacle, nor was he in Solomon's temple during this period during the period of the taking of the ark. Is everybody in agreement with that? And in reality, he wasn't in his incarnate body. He wasn't in the temple, his body, <clears throat> the body of Christ, the church. It is this in-between time of death. <clears throat> um, in death, Jesus defeated them, but then was raised far above them. <clears throat> the true story is not that the Philistines drove the ark out, though that's what it looks like in the Old Covenant, but that's a shadow, and you can't get the full picture or the true picture from the shadow. You have to know what happened in Jesus' death and in his resurrection to get the true picture. So, uh, let's see. Where we're the true story is that God raised him from the dead. See, it looks like they drove him out, but in fact, God raised him from the dead. <clears throat> Did you ever wonder? Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, <clears throat> so now I'm going to go to this next phase. <clears throat> and this ends what we've just shared right now was the ending of our last two classes on the taking of the ark. And now I want to talk about David's tabernacle because David's tabernacle was the interim tabernacle before Solomon's temple. <clears throat> In your chart, um, there's a thing that's like what I've written right here except for it's more. I put Abraham was the first and if you remember the, the original chart that I gave you, that Abraham, that all of those up until Moses... Um, and the setting forth of the tabernacle, they just worshiped God. They made an altar anywhere. It was on an individual basis. Um, but with the establishing of the Moses' tabernacle, there came a whole new aspect of, of God among his people. And in spirit, that representing Christ with us, Emmanuel, him coming in his incarnate body. Okay, and then we, we took it on to Shiloh, and then from there the taking of the ark, and then David's tabernacle and Solomon's temple. <clears throat> All right, the spiritual progression of that is God in heaven, then God in Christ during his incarnation, then the cross, and we've, we dealt with that, times of the Gentiles, the rejection by Israel. <clears throat> and now we want to talk about your next phase on your chart there. It says resurrection representing David's tabernacle. <clears throat> and the historical reality of it is this, that um, 
David's tabernacle was nothing short of just being the Holy of Holies, okay? And um, David's tabernacle represents several different things. It represents resurrection. It represents um, the 40 days where Jesus was on the earth after the resurrection. It represents... Um, the breaking down of Christ versus the law, breaking down the law so that Christ could be established. And that took a while to take place. It represents uh, the gathering at uh, Jerusalem in Acts 15, which we'll get into. All of that being important before Solomon's temple being established. All of it setting certain ground and establishing certain precedences so that uh, the church would step out of um, the law and all of those things and fully step into being the body of Christ, the temple of God. <clears throat> so that's what we want to talk about now. Let's see. I had some notes here. Maybe I should, uh, there it is. Maybe I should do this. <clears throat> All right. This is just a reminder. And maybe, yeah, there's something I could read here. <clears throat> when, when the ark got to the edge of the land, <clears throat> it stayed there for a while before David's tabernacle. <clears throat> In the interim, David became king. Now, it's interesting to know that the first thing David did, the first thing as king that David did was go down and get the ark and bring it up to Zion and put it in his tabernacle. It's the first thing he did. He didn't have a big banquet saying, I'm king and all this stuff. He, he, he knew something about this ark that it needed a tabernacle. And even at this early stage, even though it was in time of resurrection, he didn't, like our church fathers didn't, fully understand what God wanted, and David didn't. And so he brought it into a tabernacle called David's Tabernacle, which was literally the Holy of Holies. And it was there for a period of time until certain things fell into place. And then his son built the temple. But... As they're at the edge of the land, or the ark is at the edge of the land, David takes a, all these people and they go down and they get the ark and they start coming back. And there's all of this singing and dancing and rejoicing. And I mean, they're just going nuts. And it's just this glorious time and a jubilation and rejoicing like Israel had, maybe hadn't seen in the land, you know, since Joshua. And uh, there's this whole uh, thing going on there. <clears throat> and uh, I wrote, uh, let's see. <coughs> Did you ever wonder why there was such joy and rejoicing that took place when the ark came back to Israel? David and all Israel bringing the ark back is a picture of Jesus leading captivity captive. This is the ark coming out of that time of death into resurrection, coming out of the enemy's camp, having spoiled principalities and powers and making a show of them openly. And so turn with me now, and we don't need 1 Samuel anymore. Uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And in Ephesians 4, verse 7, we'll read down through <clears throat> all 10 at least. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And so grace is not just handed you. Don't ask for grace apart from Christ. You're given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. <clears throat> and wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high... 
He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he, now, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Does that sound familiar? That's the Philistines' territory. That's their, that's their domain. That's their realm. And he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now he that ascended, I'm reading verse 9 again. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And so we see the shadow. We see a man, David, who has this heart for God. And he goes and gets the ark and he brings it back and establishes it in Israel again. But he does, he does you know, does some weird things. He sets up a tent in his own backyard and puts the ark in there instead of taking it down to Moses' tabernacle because God will never operate by Moses' tabernacle again. He never did after that, historically. And spiritually, Jesus is not going to come in that same way. He's going to come in his body, and I, there's a whole explanation for that, and this relates to the temple, so no need talking ahead. Um, but um, also with this, let's look in uh, Psalms, Psalm uh, 68, Psalm 68. Verse 18, this is where Ephesians came from, Psalm 68, 18. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts from men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. And this is the return of the ark to, to begin to dwell among them in a different way than he did in Moses' tabernacle. That era is over. <clears throat> and so the picture of this, uh, uh, I, say, I wrote down a scripture here, and they shall come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. All right. Well, in the shadow, they're all happy and dancing and stuff like that and then you know David puts it on he keeps it on that ark thing I mean on that cart thing and he doesn't have the priest bring it up and God smites somebody who reached over to touch the ark and and it bummed everybody out and it was just a bad deal that's a shadow that, that that's not the truth Jesus rose victorious over all enemies and even the rebellious, he gives gifts, and the main gift he gives is grace according to the measure of Christ within us, because even the rebellious will be different if Christ is among them, as it were, in them, if you see what I'm saying. <clears throat> and that's, that's the, the, tr the, the new line of truth that God is beginning to establish with Israel and with David. <clears throat> And so, let's see. All right. So, we've seen the Old Covenant uh, picture of the taking of the ark and how that relates. We've seen some things in Psalms that are actually quoted in the New Covenant where they see these things as the resurrection, the triumph, that, that, that uh, the, the resurrection triumph where Jesus had spoiled all the principalities and powers. <clears throat> and now let's see this in the New Testament as they begin to talk about it. And this is over in Acts chapter 15. We've alluded to this before, but I want you to just see it in a slightly different light now. Acts 15. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> remind 
reminding you of the story here. Uh, well, let's just read. Uh, I start at verse 1. Let's just read some of this. It can't hurt. And certain men who came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. <clears throat> All right. um, they're teaching brethren. So I assume that they're in the brotherhood because it says they're teaching brethren. And said, you, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, a couple of thoughts came to my mind when I was reading this. One is really, you're not circumcised after the manner of Moses. You're circumcised after the manner of Abraham. Circumcision came by Abraham and was a incredible spiritual truth of the circumcision of the heart and so but they're they're saying you know uh, after the manner of Moses and so what they have done is they've gathered all this reality up into Moses's tabernacle it's all related to this old tabernacle in the in the if you will and not necessarily Christ incarnate but the old covenant way do you understand what I'm alluding to here and what I think they're alluding to because they're trying to keep the law. And then uh, verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. All right. So there ends up being all these people coming to Jerusalem. And they're coming there. It's... Uh, it's like this big uh, junta, you know, this big gathering of people who are trying to figure out specifically the way this is worded is this question, this question. And this question is really bugging them. Now, keep in the back of your mind that it's going to be settled by James, though we're going to hear from a lot of other people. But keep in the back of your mind that James is going to speak up and he's going to refer to this David's tabernacle thing. Okay. So there is significance specifically. There are answers specifically that come from David's tabernacle in relationship to the law. And that's why I put it on the little chart. Uh, how David's tabernacle effects a change from the old covenant to the new. It's like a transition from Moses' tabernacle to Solomon's temple. From Jesus incarnate, Jesus walking around with us. People say, I, I, I've heard this all my life. Oh, I wish I could have been alive when Jesus was here. Folks, we're supposed to have something better. That, that Moses' tabernacle was done away. He left. He was, if, as for all intents and purposes, three and a half years. I mean, that's not very long for thousands of years to pass and generations upon generations to go, oh, I wish I could have been alive back then. He didn't think that much of it because he wanted to put his son within us. He wanted to establish a temple, not just a tabernacle. And so, uh, just remember that, that this transitional period here is marked by David's tabernacle. Um, and verse 3, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. Certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. Well, let's see. You're saved by through or believing. They believed. I don't know. What did they believe? 
You know, I mean, I'm just, I, I just, I just have to question that because they're not believing in grace; they're believing in law. In fact, they said, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. So, what are they believing in? I don't know. That's why they're still of the sect of the Pharisees instead of the brotherhood. The brotherhood. <clears throat> and, and they believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Oh, my God, folks. This, this is an incredibly important time period between Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple. This is the time period of David's tabernacle. This is the time period to get some things settled so that you can move on to kingdom things. You know, so, I mean, many churches are so busy messing with people's flesh and the things of this world and they're all this junk, they never have time for kingdom problems. You know, I mean, that, you know, I, if I'm going to have problems, I'd like for them to be problems of the kingdom, not just flesh problems and people just fleshing out all the time. <clears throat> all right, so verse 6, and the apostles and elders came together to consider, to consider of this matter. Came together to consider of this matter. That's how we say it in Texas. I want to feel of it. I don't just want to feel it. I want to feel of it. I want to, you know, consider of this matter. Thank God. Verse 7, And when there had been much dis disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, Hmm. He must have thought there's somebody else there beside brethren. Just men. Hmm. And Paul's pretty sharp like that anyway, isn't he? <laughs> um, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. I'm sorry, am I quoting, who am I quoting here? Peter. Thank you very much. Not Paul. Peter. Peter rose up. And he's talking about this Cornelius thing. So it doesn't say that there, does it? I don't think it does. But he's talking about the Cornelius incident at the house of Cornelius. Um, so let me repeat that again. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knoweth the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Okay, now, I just have a question here. At what point did he go up to Antioch and start separate? Anyway, you know. But I'm, I'm glad that situation came up and Paul brought it up in Galatians where <laughs> Peter went up to Antioch and then he's sitting there with Gentiles who are saved and starts separating and then Barnabas, who's been with Paul all these years, starts getting, you know, moved with this, and he starts separating too. And out of that comes Paul's explanation in Galatians comes, Galatians 2.20. There's neither Greek nor Jew, and I'm quoting now from Ephesians and Colossians, but there's neither Greek nor Jew, for we are crucified with Christ, and Christ lives with us, in us. That's his... That's his definitive answer why we can sit with a Gentile or whatever and not be affected because we're dead and they're dead and Christ liveth. Where? In us, not around us, not Christ incarnate, not Moses' tabernacle. All right, so... Um, Verse 10, now therefore, why put God to the test to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What yoke is he talking about? The law. You break it in one point. You broke the whole law. Well, that's tough. Bless you. I don't really know how to do that because I'm, I'm, I'm 
not a true believer. <laughs> All right. Um, and then verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. <clears throat> verse 12, then all the multitude kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among all the Gentiles by them. Okay. Gosh, I'm just, you know, I, I see people read read these books of the Bible, especially the book of Acts with rose-colored glasses and just think everything's so really wonderful. This is the very front edge of Christianity and they're still trying to find the definitions of the word of God as God sees it based on the cross and on the resurrection. And they're, you know, seeing this stuff and having it fully working in you is two different things. Can I get amen? You know, uh, it, it starts with seeing. you got to see it before it will ever be worked in you. But uh, I'm just looking here, and I'm watching how, uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas are, um, you know, they get there, and, and uh, they're all excited, and it talks about them talk, and talking to everybody about all the great things that has happened with them. Then Peter stands up. And he tells what God did with him. And it specifically says, you know what God did by me. I'm not saying he's not of God. I'm saying maybe, maybe he's still got some flesh like we do. You know. And then immediately after that, then uh, all the multitude kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. You may not see anything in that, but I do in, in the wording there, but more so by James, who is the head of the church there. And when he speaks, buddy boy, he ain't telling what he did. He's telling what God wrought by his hands. And he's talking about David's tabernacle, and he's using that as a picture of the definitive answer that not your experiences and not your experiences, not you, nor you, not your ministry, nor your ministry, but God's ministry through this progression of the house of God and him by establishing David's tabernacle began to break down all these walls and all these things that were Dividing everyone. Okay, so verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God first did visit the nations to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down, and I will build again its ruins and I will set it up. And we're going to just stop right there. There's more. You can read it, but I don't want to emphasize that part of it. <clears throat> um, just read a sentence here. <clears throat> the very tabernacle itself excludes, uh, talking about David's tabernacle, the very tabernacle of David excludes all the parts of Moses' tabernacle that deal with the failures of sin that resulted from breaking the law. It was the Holy of Holies. You didn't have to go through an altar and die in the sense of deal with your sins and blood, sprinkling everything and all that stuff. You had direct access. And is that not what's declared to us? And uh, to help you see this, let's go to, uh, how much time have I got? 12 minutes. 12 minutes? 12 disciples. Okay, 12 and a <laughs> half. Do you, think, do you think that there might have been a little tiny midget that was with <laughs> Sorry. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> Gosh, I was sure I was on the right track there. <laughs> uh, Hebrews 9. We've, we went over this a little bit. I want to I wanna, I wanna really, I want us to see this. I want us to really see what Hebrews is saying here in Hebrews 9. And the best way to do that 
is to, in your Bible, if you feel the freedom to, uh, get a pen and cir circle the word tabernacle every time it comes up. <clears throat> um, so let's start at verse 1. Hebrews 9, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary, and that word sanctuary can be related to the tabernacle, so you can circle that. <clears throat> verse 2, For there was a tabernacle made, the first in which, okay, so he is literally saying that there was a tabernacle made, and the first one was Moses' tabernacle, and he begins to describe it here. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first in which was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after that, the second, um, after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So let me just do, let me just do it like this so we can see it here. Okay. And let's see, I've divided it too much here, haven't I? Okay. Um, showbread and candlestick. And now this puts the altar of incense on the inside because the wasn't it was the fragrance that went through the veil and filled that, and also it was taken in by the high priest. But anyway, the, the Moses' tabernacle was made of uh, the actual tent part was here. This part right here is the outer court, and it had the altar, and it had the laver, but then you went into a door right here, and you went into what they're calling the sanctuary, and it had the table of showbread and the altar of incense and the seven-branch candlestick. And then there was one more door, and it went into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was and the golden cherubim, and, and, um, <clears throat> and that was where the presence of God was. And as we know, you know, the priest could go regularly into this part and into Moses' tabernacle part, but into the Holy of Holies, only the priest once every year. So he's going to allude to this, but he's using New Testament words here, and he's calling this first section here the first tabernacle, and he's calling the Holy of Holies the second. Now listen, listen, listen to the wording. We'll read verse 2 again. For there was a tabernacle, the first in which was the lampstand and the table and showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That's the whole, what we call the holy place. And he's calling that a tabernacle. Okay. And verse 3, And after the second veil, meaning going through another door, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Do you see it? He's literally identifying two tabernacles. And guess what? He's going to use this just like James did to show the difference between the Old Covenant and the New. And that's what he's talking about. The, uh, then verily the first covenant had ordinances of divine worship, which they went into this first tabernacle and they did it, but that was it. That was as far as they got. They dealt with sins, they dealt with all this kind of stuff, they did that. All right, well, let's keep reading because there's more. <clears throat> Verse 4 still speaking of the Holy of Holies, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold in which was the golden pot that had man and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubim of, cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus prepared, the priests went always into the first tabernacle. What did that just say? The first tabernacle. It didn't say in the Moses' tabernacle or one da-da-da-da. It has divided the tabernacles, and it is saying that the first part of that is Moses' tabernacle, and the second part is the Holy of Holies, David's tabernacle, which was taken, separated, when the taking of the ark took place. All right, but there's more. Um, 
So let's, let's finish verse 6. Now, when these things were thus prepared, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Why does it say that? Because verse 1 says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. He's saying that this first part was the service of the old covenant. You can't get around it. <laughs> this is exactly what it's saying. Okay, so um, verse 7, but into the second, and again, the second here is the, the uh, Holy of Holies or David's tabernacle. Now remember, James alluded to this as a proof that we're not under the law anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's, and then you got the writer of Hebrews backing that up big time, but he's not even finished here. Um, verse 7, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Now get this. He says, verse 8, the Holy Spirit thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. That's incredible if you actually see that, that the, this whole part here, the, the outer court and the holy place, not the holy of holies, the holy place had to no longer be standing to represent the new covenant. Well, what do you think the taking of the ark was all about? They took the ark and David brought it back and set up a tent in his backyard and it was the Holy of Holies, separate from the other. And the other, you could say, well, it had a Holy of Holies too. No, it didn't. There was nothing holy about their holies. Because God wasn't there. So it wasn't the Holy of Holies. And all they did was run around doing the service under the first one because he didn't say uh, both of them could coexist. He said the Holy Spirit is thus signifying that there is no way into the new covenant as long as the law exists. It's beautiful. Not only that, it's the word of God. It's written here plain. But we're not even finished with this. This is so good. Um, so let's read verse 8 again. And the Holy Spirit thus signifying, signifying by what? By the fact that there was no service into there. Uh, signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle uh, was yet standing. Um, and, of course, he goes on to say in verse 9, which are a figure of the time then present. But let's, let's skip that right now. And let's go to verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect, what's the next word? Tabernacle. David's tabernacle. This separation was all about the dividing from the law and the old covenant to the new covenant. And these guys, so here you have this big old congregate, you know, uh, gathering of people to discuss the, whether the law is this and that. And, and Peter saying, yeah, well, God did stuff through me and he, you know, he really didn't. Paul and Barnabas are over here going, yeah, well, God used us and everything. And James stands up and he points to David's tabernacle. And he said, the prophet said, I will, God said, I will build again the tabernacle of David. And I will reestablish that reality, but not in shadow form. In reality, so... Uh, so I've got, I've just barely started in this and our TikTok is coming down. So let's see. Okay, we're going to stop here. But, but this just begins to really show us the power of what happened with the taking of the ark, representing the cross, the putting of the ark 
down into the lowest parts of the earth, if you will, that because that's a type and shadow of what happened. And there he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. And then this triumphal, you know, uh, they shall come singing unto Zion, an everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. And it's not just that they're just singing and rejoicing over the resurrection. It is that the, the ark of God is not taken back to Moses' tabernacle. Never again. It is set up in David's tabernacle. And with it, reality upon reality of who we are and where we are in this thing and what God is doing. So we'll, we'll finish this when we get back. Take a break.